a lot of people who listen to this who are looking for a job or about to look for a job as a recruit, someone who has expertise in hiring people. What is what are the big things for you? This is a token. Oh, it's Thursday, September 1st. That's amazing. All right. This is the Token CEO podcast. It is Thursday, September 1st. Here is what we're doing today. We have first before anything. We have five people to call out. These people are getting merch, they're getting one-on-ones, and they're getting the illustrious honor of being mentioned in this show. So Abby Gerwe, Sam Russo, Ashley Nicole, Marcus Levine, and Katie Hartig are the five people who submitted ratings and reviews, and they're our lucky winners. The other really cool thing, which I'm even more excited about, is that we're going to do something for everyone who submitted a rating and review and sent us a screenshot. Um, So just be on the lookout for us in your DMs. I think it's great, I'm excited about it, it's just for you, and then the biggest thing is just a huge thank you to everyone who gave us a rating and review. We appreciate you so much. It made us feel so good. Um, Okay, so here's what we're doing today. We're having a themed episode. We're talking about a couple different things. We're talking about what you need to do to make the most of your college career. So how do you rock the last year or the last two years of your college career? And then even more importantly, how do you get a job after college? And once you have that job, how do you keep that job? So we're going to talk to Nick Marticelli. So Nick Marticelli runs recruiting for Barstool Sports. Um, He's going to tell you what you need to do, what you shouldn't do, what you absolutely must do. That's what we're talking about today. We are going to have a quick non sequitur on quiet quitting. I'm real riled up about quiet quitting. Okay, so let's give some context for college right now before we just jump in. So the first part of this episode is about making the most of your college career. This episode is targeted to people who are coming or who are in college or coming out of college, but really it's targeted to people, you know, in their early 20s, your late teens, your early 20s. Whether you go to college or not, I still think most of this stuff applies to you. Whether you're in your 40s or you're 19, I still think you can get some great takeaways. So um, the first thing is college is getting impossible to afford. So the average cost of college has jumped over 3,000% in the last 50 years. What's crazy about the cost of college is one, how much debt people have coming out of college. I think the second thing is it's causing people to question what you get from college. I think the big thing happening with college is that people are starting to question, one, can they afford college? Two, is it worth it to come out of college with so much debt? Student loan debt has more than doubled in a decade. It is over $1.4 trillion. So that's how much debt recent college grads or college grads in general have amassed in this country. That is crazy. I think the third piece is people are starting to question what you get from college. So I was reading this weekend, you know, I love Barry Weiss. I was reading uh, her newsletter called Common Sense. And there was a there was a blog or an article written by a recent college grad. And not only was this person talking just about the cost of education, what she also was lamenting is is kind of the lack of freedom at college and the lack of free speech in colleges and just this need for group think and and that essentially what's happening is that colleges have become or colleges have just become this hub of wokeness where you can't have a different opinion there isn't freedom of thought or expression if you don't go along with the vast majority of thinking you're unsafe it, it is not a safe place to create and share ideas. And I think this sucks because I think that's actually the best part of college. I experienced this with Colby. I went back to Colby in my job here. I had gotten an award there for something and they didn't want to mention Barstool Sports because it wasn't PC and that there was controversy around the brand and it didn't appeal to the governing line of thought at a liberal arts college. And I was like, what the fuck? This is ridiculous. Um, Mostly it's ridiculous because that's the whole point of going to a liberal arts college, which is you learn how to think, you learn how to write, you learn how to express your ideas, you learn how to debate, you learn how to learn. And, you know, I think what's really hard right now in college culture is that it's not 
you know, it's not a mixing pot of ideas and perspectives and personalities and voices. It's really become a place of fear and a place of conformity, which I think is bad in any learning environment. And then that coupled with the fact that you're going to be like buried in debt for so many years, I think really has people questioning, why should I go to college? So Biden, so President Biden on the 24th of August, um, made an announcement that uh, there will be up to $20,000 in debt cancellation to Pell Grant recipients um, with loans held by the Department of Education, and there will be $10,000 in debt ca cancellation to non-Pell Grant recipients. So one of the uh, premises that Biden ran on was that he would provide college debt relief. That came out this week. You are eligible for this relief if you make less than $125,000 thousand dollars as an individual or if your parents uh, make less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars tying it back to barstool for a second so we have a program called the viceroys so big shout out to gaz um, kyle katie we have an awesome team megan eight years ago gaz and team created the viceroy cr created the viceroy platform i wouldn't call it a vice a platform back in 2014 so there were 12 accounts so 12 schools had Barstool Viceroy account. So it was, for example, Barstool Zoom Ass. And the whole idea was that there was a voice that was like Barstool, felt like Barstool, looked like Barstool, but that was campus specific. So that was eight years ago. We had 12 accounts. We probably had 12 people working with us on those accounts. Flash forward, we now have 800 students who work with us across, I want to say, almost 2,000 accounts. Uh, we have 427 schools who have a Barstool Viceroy account or a Barstool Chicks account, which is something um, I helped create for basically a female perspective on college. They've got 7.5 million Instagram followers, 2.9 million Twitter followers, 1.9 a million TikTok followers. We've done a huge amount of merch. This has become a great business for us. It's also our single best source of talent. So Devin on the ones and twos comes from the Viceroy program. Many of our best people, including Tyler O'Day, RIP, came from the Viceroy program. I think that the kids working in this program are getting honestly firsthand job experience that they could never get anyone else. But I would say even more broadly, like when I was in college, I worked in the athletic department. I basically like cleaned out file cabinets, but it was working experience. I was able to make a little money and it gave me something, frankly, to put on my resume so that when I went to apply for jobs, it didn't look like I just fucked around and drank beer for four years. So great things for people to do in college. So if you are a senior in college, you're a junior in college, you're a sophomore or freshman in college, we've gathered up a bunch of perspective and advice on things that you can do and you should not do to make the most of your college experience. Um, obviously take this result, uh, take this advice with a grain of salt because I wouldn't say exactly we know what we're doing, mm -hmm. but I think it's a, college is a really special time in your life. It's this time in your life where you find out who you are, you can learn so much. It's such a luxury. Like it, honestly, for anyone who's listening to this and you're in college, it's such a luxury. Like take advantage of it. Learn how to take critical feedback. Understand if you can write well or not and work on it. Meet people. Meet people who are different than you. Make connections. Try things. Um, immerse yourself in the collegiate experience because there's really nothing like that after you leave college. And honestly, I think you spend like the first three or four years after college missing it. Make the most of this time because it's a really rare, unique time in your life. So, Things to do, um, get an internship. If you have the time to go out and drink an, an inordinate amount of beer or high noons, you probably have time to get an internship. Try to get an internship in college. It doesn't matter if it's sexy. It doesn't matter if it's exactly what you wanna be doing. Get work experience because when you get out of school, someone's going to say, what'd you do while you were at college? What they really want to know is what kind of initiative you took in college. Um, to that, make sure you're learning. Um, three, this one is really important. If you are in college, you're a college senior and you're about to apply for jobs, check your social media. Make sure that you're comfortable with your future employer seeing them. Um, be bold about networking, ask for help. 
ask for ideas, ask for connections. Now you got to show up with something and you can't just be like, uh, can you introduce me to so-and-so? You got to know what you're going to say to so-and-so and why you want an introduction to them, but take advantage about networking. Get crit critical feedback from your professors. One of the things we're going through some 360 reviews here. And one of the things, I think I talked about this last week is that one of we're seeing from recent college grads that they don't like feedback like they actually feel offended at the notion of feedback they feel offense at the idea that someone would criticize who they are what they do how they work and that's really unhealthy like if you can't take feedback you're never going to grow you won't develop you and you will I, I honestly feel like you won't reach your potential last one i would say is get involved with clubs and boards here's why i would say do that one most clubs are annoying and you're going to have to deal with annoying people who talk too much but you're going to have to figure out a way to work with other people in a group setting where everybody wants to talk everybody has a point of view everybody has a certain way that they want things done it's a great experience. It's a great opportunity to learn how to work with other people. You're going to need that in your job after school. All right, let's go into don'ts. So most of these are mistakes that I've made. So just, again, take with a grain of salt. Don't get into credit card debt. Try to get some control of your spending. It's OK to spend. It's OK to make a mistake. It's OK to splurge. But try not to get out, get out of school with more debt than you have to have. The second one is like, don't sweat it. I think the, the biggest thing I feel like when I talk to college kids is like, there just feels so much pressure on having to have it all figured out. You don't need to have it all figured out. I still don't have it figured out and I'm in my mid forties. Like you're not gonna figure it out. Just take the pressure off yourself to be perfect and to have everything done and to make everything just so. Don't make the same mistakes you made your freshman year. Like I'm all for mistakes. I make mistakes every single day, big ones, small ones, little ones, disastrous ones. What I try not to do is to make the same mistake twice. I'm not even perfect at that, but by the time you're a senior in college, don't make the same mistakes that you made as a freshman. Learn from those mistakes. If you can learn from your mistakes, you're gonna be great in life. Use this opportunity to learn. There are very few times in your life where your only job is to learn, and college is one of them. Um, don't get blackout drunk on your first night of school. That's a good one. Don't get caught cheating on a final exam. That's great advice. Don't cheat. Don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend in college. I agree with this. I think college is like this great time to be free and to be you. And, and hey, if you fall in love with your person, you fall in love with your person. But if you only are attached to one person, it's hard to meet a lot of people in college. And I think that's part one of the best things of college. Take advantage of study abroad. I did not take advantage of study abroad and it was one of my biggest regrets coming out of college. The last one I have is don't mail it in. I think that if you mail it in in college, it just sets a horrible pace and tone and tenor and kind of frequency for the rest of your life. Like, look, you can always mail it in in certain parts of your life, but you should dial it up in others. You know, I love, I'm very interested in this woman right now who she's kind of mailing in at school, but she's built like a juggernaut babysitting business. And I'm like, okay, great. She's getting, you know, A's and B's in her classes. And then she's building a big, a, a big local business alongside of that. I don't think that's mailing it in. She may not be going above and beyond on statistics or history or social or sociology, but she is doing something bigger for that will set her up for her life. So that's our, that's our perspective on college, making the most of college or frankly, just making the most of your early, making the most of your early twenties. While we're talking about this, let's talk about Mint Mobile. So Mint Mobile is a affordable premium wireless provider. They are shaking up the industry with their modern family plan. Let's hear about it. I love people that shake up the industry. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate, whether you're buying one for a family and at Mint, families start at two lines. So let's, let's just be clear here. Who doesn't want to save money? 
who spends an inordinate amount of money on their cell phone bill? That's me. This morning I got locked out of the app store. Have you ever been out locked out of the app store? It's a disaster. It's so fucking annoying. And then I had to like be on hold with Apple help for like two years. Um, I don't have Mint Mobile. I'm going to get Mint Mobile because all plans come with unlimited talk and text and high speed data delivered on the la- nation's largest 5G network. I love that. Um, plus, Mint Mobile's modern family plan lets you mix and match data plans so that everyone gets the right amount of data that's right for them. You can own, use your own phone with a Mint Mobile plan and you can keep your same number. So if you want to change from AT&T or Verizon and you want to switch over to Mint, you can do that and still keep your phone number. And if you switch to Mint Mobile, you can get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. Who doesn't love that? Get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month, including the modern family plan at mintmobile.com slash token. That's mintmobile.com slash token. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month. I mean, that's like a bajillion percent discount off my wireless bill at mintmobile.com slash token. So next up we have Q&A. Our, Q&A. our Q&As this week are from our viceroys, so they're from current college students. First one is, in an ever-growing electronic world. <laughs> in a, in an ever-growing electronic world, where most, where most communication is done online, how can one use their in-person communication skills to increase their chances of being hired for a job? and an internship. Okay, look, like I would use the ever-growing electronic world to get yourself an in-person meeting. That means your electronic skills, or in other words, your ability to email, your ability to text, your ability to write a resume that's succinct and clear, your ability to write a cover letter that someone doesn't just toss out the window when they get it, those skills have to be great. I think it's better to be short. I think it's better to be sharp. I think it's great to be to the point. It's important that you don't have spelling errors. Obviously, in-person matters the most. If you have great email skills or your resume looks perfect and you show up at an interview and you're a total dud, then of course you're not going to get the job. Like You got to win it in the in-person meeting. The way I think that you can do that is be prepared, obviously. So like, know what the fuck you're talking about. Know what the company does. Know what the role you're going for does and how you would do it even better. Two is be charming, you know, be convincing, be charming, be a good listener. Three, send a follow up after, you know, send a follow up after your interview, thanking the person for their time and offering an idea or a takeaway from your conversation. But the long and short of it is you need electronic skills and in-person skills to do your job in the same way that you need electronic skills and human skills to be able to land a job and to be able to nail an interview. All right. Second, how can I sell myself for employers? How can I sell myself to employers for jobs that are usually filled by individuals with years of experience? One, you're not selling yourself like you're offering your skills in exchange for a healthy paycheck. Um, The first thing I would say is hustle matters. So I always give a job to somebody who has hustle and smarts and seems scrappy and is interested. I don't care if someone has 10 times the experience, if they seem apathetic, if they seem casual, if they seem disinterested, if they don't show ambition, I would rather go with a scrappy person every single day of the week. And I think most employers are like that. And certainly any employer that you want to be employed by is like that. So um, we just went through this. We were interviewing candidates and there was a more senior candidate. And the, and the person was just kind of apathetic. The like, attitude was like, yeah, I can do that job. Yeah, I've done this. The person seemed very enamored of their current job and all of their experience and everything they've done. They offered zero, and I mean zero, suggestions of or ideas for what they would do at Barstool Sports. We compared that person to someone with way less experience but with a way bigger attitude, with way more passion, with way more creativity, better follow-up, more hustle, and that person got the job. So I think just show your hustle, show your interest, show your the impact of the experience you have. My other observation on this is most people cannot articulate their career very well at all. Like if you can't 
articulate your career in four sentences that an idiot can understand, then like try again. So be able to articulate your experience in a way that's really impactful. Most people get bored listening to like, I've done this, then I worked there, then I worked there, then I worked there, then I worked there, like nobody cares. What people want to hear is, how have you done something that's applicable to the job that person is hiring for? How are you going to make that person more successful? And then ultimately, make sure that person sells right back to you. So it's not just you, the candidate, selling to get the job. It's you, the candidate, hearing how well the employer sells and making the decision if you have the opportunity, if you want to work there. Last question, how much does your degree matter in terms of getting a job or an internship? For example, if my degree is in e economics and I try to pursue a career in sports, am I at a disadvantage? Absolutely not. Nobody cares what your major is, literally. Your mother might care, but like I actually don't even think she cares. Nobody gives a shit what your major is. Um, I wanted to be an econ major. I wasn't smart enough to be an econ major, so, so I was a sociology major. Whatever, I loved it. Um, I don't think anybody cares what your major is. I couldn't tell you anyone here what their major was. Honestly, I have zero idea. I could care less. Like I don't even care to look. I think the biggest thing is Find a way to parlay your experience in college, whether it's your athletic career, whether it's your internships, the jobs you had over the summer, the classes you took, the things you did, the clubs you were a part of. Take all of those things and articulate what you learned from them, what you did at them, the impact it had on other people, and then use that as a way to get your job. I don't think there's any correlation unless, let's say, like you're an accountant, like if you're in finance, I guess your major matters. Like, I don't really want people here, you know, doing the books who don't know how to add. But beyond that, I don't really care what people's majors are. And I think most people don't care. It's all about your experience. It's all about what you made of it. And it's all about how you articulate that as something that, that a future employer wants. All right, I've been known to like a men's wallet. Um, Ridge wallet is an awesome wallet. So. In anticipation of all the money you are about to make, why not get a Ridge wallet? So what the Ridge wallet does, it's very thin, it's a minimalist case, it holds up to 12 cards, it's got all this titanium and shit in it that prevents digital pickpocketing. I didn't even know that that was a thing, but apparently that's a thing. I seem to remember actually Hank, one of the barstool guys, or no, it was Frankie Borelli. Frankie Borelli was walking down, the pizza guy, he's now a foreplay guy, um, he was walking down the street and he said that like he walked by a guy and his phone all of a sudden got zapped. So I'm sure that happens in your wallet too. What's great about Ridge wallets is they protect you from that. Um, the durable material means that every wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. And if you go to their site, which is ridgewallet.com, it would be amazing if they put the URL in this ad, but whatever. Um, no, nope, not in here. Definitely keep that in. Um, if you go to ridgewallet.com and you use code Erica, E-R-I-K-A, you can get 10% off your order. Every dollar spent on their website, which is ridgewallet.com before September 30th, you'll get entered to win a brand new upgraded Ford Bronco. That, how very David Portnoy of you. Um, that's $75,000. So if you prefer cash and you don't want to look like Dave Portnoy and drive a Bronco, you can have a chance to either win the Bronco or get the cash. That's ridgewallet.com, code Erica for 10% off. So speaking of things that employers want, we have Nick Marticelli joining us. Nick Marticelli is the Barstool Sports King of LinkedIn. He runs recruiting for us. Um, he has a funny story, which is that when he got to Barstool on his first day, we forgot about him. <laughs> In a miracle of all miracles, he still works here and convinces other people to come work here. What I love about this conversation is he gives a lot of practical advice about what recruiters are looking for, the tools and platforms that a rec recruiter uses, and also tips and skills on making your best impression in, a, in an interview and doing what it takes to land the job. All right, so Nick, describe who you are, how you got to Barstool, and what you do here. Yeah, um, so I'm Nick Marticelli. Mm -hmm. I'm our director of talent acquisition. What's your middle name, like Anthony? Daniel. Oh, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I learned pegged Anthony on that one. Yeah. Um, what I do here, so I manage our recruitment team. And when I got hired, I was the only recruiter. 
and really everything from posting our jobs to interviewing the candidates as the first round, scheduling interviews, our talent branding and everything that we put up on our careers page, all of our job descriptions. What did you do before? I was a recruiter again before. Okay. I worked as a talent acquisition manager at a startup company. Okay. And then before that, worked in-house at another like insurance company and then worked for doing an agency. Doing talent recruiting. Yeah, so I've been doing it about like six years mixed between like agency where you know, you're know you like a headhunter okay. like, trying to get companies to pay to have you fill the job. Mm -hmm. Um, and then working in-house for about like four and a half of those years. And what 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 was it about recruiting people? I actually fell into recruiting kind of in a weird way, which like every recruiter will kind of tell you. So okay. I was actually working at Enterprise Rent a Car. Okay. And I wanted to come to New York. I visited. Thought Where it are seemed you from? Cool. California. Okay. Yeah, it's Heard Southern it. California. Yeah, it's big. You know, so I was working for Enterprise Rent a Car, and I'd actually visited New York, and I was actually watching Barstool content. And I you was, were a Barstool fan before you, yeah, got, or you knew of it. Yeah, so I was watching stool scenes, mm -hmm. and it was right around the time that you know we moved here, and so I was like, man, New York seems so fun. They have this like rambunctious office. Like, I want to work for a fun, fast-paced, like dynamic company one day. I'm gonna move to New York. I'm gonna move with Enterprise, but maybe once I'm there, I'll find something else and Enterprise actually messed up my transfer. And so I came out here with no job and oh my was God. just like, I'm gonna make it, I'll I'm figure it, it out. Um, and I interviewed like 10 places in two weeks and one of them was recruiting. And it was just this kind of natural thing of like, I used to do car sales and I do car rentals. It's this like consultative, like I'm gonna walk you through a process kind of approach. Um, and so it just came really naturally to me where it was like you build the relationship, you get to know the person, you're, you're not selling them something necessarily, yeah, you're but like you kind are. Of in a like, relationship you're like, them. hey, here's why our company is so great and here's why you should want to work for us compared to the next person. So huh. um, that's kind of how I fell into it. And it just was one of those things that it really never felt that hard or like felt unnatural. It was like, I can have conversations all day. This is easy. So. It's really just learning the other stuff. So. Okay, so then you're a Barstool fan. You come to New York. You don't have a job. You're like, fuck, I guess I'll just apply to recruiting jobs. There was, Yeah, I was and on Indeed and just looking for anything sales entry jobs, level. Sales, recruiting, recruiting jobs. yeah. Actually, the recruiting one, they reached out to me. Um, they wanted me to do a job out in like Newark doing... Um, fleet logistics for BMW and I was oh, like oh that actually be interesting it was so interesting much. but I was like I was living on the Upper East Side I was like I don't really want to go to Newark every yeah. day so I um through the conversation they just all of a sudden just cut me off and they're like do you want to be a recruiter I'm like I, I guess sure like you know and they're like do you know banking and finance and I was like actually yeah like I went to school for business so like familiar with some yeah. of the topics so it was just like a week wow. later I had an offer yeah and then how did you stumble upon a job here I I think ever since I was a fan, it was one of those things that it was just casually like, hey, if they ever have an opening, you know, you have a mental list of like those dream companies, yep. you know, like the big ones kind yep. of thing. And I was like, I'm going to always have my eye out if they have an opening. And at my last company, it was just like time for me to find something new. And I looked and there was an opening for a talent acquisition like team lead. And I started reading the job description and it was just every single thing was like, that's me. Yeah. That's my resume. So. I applied and you know I did the thing that everyone does you try to reach out to people and just with the volume of like I know now like of what we deal with um, I didn't hear back from anyone at first mm -hmm. and about a week later you know had an interview and went through the whole interview process and it was just so natural it felt like that's um, awesome we have a lot of people who listen to this who are looking for a job or about to look for a job what is it that you look for like as a recruit, someone who has expertise in hiring people, what is what are the big things for you? Um, well, I think for starters, your resume kind of has to match like 75% of the job, 60% yeah. of the job. Um, you know, if we have an opening for a salesperson and you don't do any kind of sales, you've never mm -hmm. done any kind of sales, even if you have experience that you can like swing into sales, yeah. like, you know, if, but if your resume just doesn't match at all, it's like... So that's the first thing, like yep. there has to be some kind of parallel. From there, I think it's, we look for people here, especially who are creative, can go with the flow. Uh, I say go with the flow, like they're willing to try things yep. before they get frustrated. Um, they're willing to adapt to a fast pace. Um, I think people who wanna think outside the box and do something different other than, you know, you could go and work at whatever company and clock in and clock out and just kind of do it. But someone who wants to do something unique yeah. and that's really going to like 
take things to the next level. So when we talk to people, you can kind of get a sense of like what their work values are, what their principles are, things like that. Yeah. Where have you, a lot of it's like in the past, you know, like tell me about a time you did this, walk me through a time you did that, describe to me how you, you know, those types of open-ended questions. Are you able to stay focused when you're having these calls with people? It's, I think it's Do you muscle. take notes? Sometimes I have to take notes if I want to focus. The whole time. Okay. Uh, while I'm talking, I'm just yeah. typing, typing, typing. Um, I think there's, it's just, you do it so much. Yeah. Like, you know, back when I first started here, I want to say I was doing 10 or 12, 15 calls a day. Um, so you do that every single day yeah. while you're taking notes. It just, it gets so that simple. That becomes a habit. Yeah. Um, describe being a recruiter here. Like, just a sense of the volume. Sometimes I think people don't understand. Like, I had a guy on LinkedIn this morning that's like, no one at Barstool ever responds to me. How do I get a job at Barstool? And I'm like, if you had any idea yeah. how much the volume we deal with, and it's such a, it's it's so fortunate. It's We're so lucky for it. But yeah. give, give people a sense of that perspective. I think that is, like, the thing is, like, I'm always just appreciative that people are so interested. Um, and so it's definitely, like, a good problem to have. But it is a lot. It's uh, a problem, nonetheless. It's, yeah, it, it's a lot. So I think, for example, it's a lot of these jobs that are a little bit more like entry level. We'll post like a social media specialist. It'll have a thousand applications in the first like 12 hours that it's yeah. up. Um, and that's like consistent. It just keeps getting more and more. Um, so we really have to like, you can use like keyword searches, things like that to try to find some like keywords in the resumes to draw them out and like pull them to the top. But personally, like I know what it's like to look for a job. So I really try to look at as many of them as I mm -hmm. can. Even if that's like, you know, I can only spend five, 10 seconds on a resume. I, I try to see as many of them as I can. Um, so when it, we post a bunch of jobs, like we've hired 110 people this year. Yeah. Which is insane. I say we're not going to do it. And then we do that every year. Yeah. Are you like, fuck, they have another job? No, like, I love it. it it's I'm I, I surfed in college barely. I actually took surfing as my PE class. Okay. School in That's SoCal. Amazing. <laughs> um, and so with that tiny little three foot waves, but it's a rush that I imagine of like what a surfer might feel on a big wave is like, oh man, if I mess this up, like you know, okay. why didn't we fill this role? What There's happened? There's some risk to it. You know, yeah. like why don't we? Why isn't our revenue where we were because we didn't hire this role or something? Yeah. But. I get to be the one to do that, me yeah. and my team. And like, we're the one that's going to add someone new that's going to, you know, really move the needle for us. Yeah, it's us. a big and responsibility. So to me, it's a rush. I love yeah, it. It's that's like awesome. the pressure of it. I love the feeling. Yeah. Um, what's the question that you get in these interviews that you hate when somebody um, asks that you're just like, Ugh. what is big cat like or something like okay. that? I get, okay. I get a lot of questions about the talent and the, the content. What's Dave like? Yeah, that's yeah. another one that I'm like, what do you, how do you answer that? I mean, I've never met him. Uh, really? Yeah, I've never oh, met him. Oh, do you want to meet him this week? Sure. Yeah. Um, oh. So I'm like, I don't know. I've never met him. Like, I, I've seen him, like, around. Do you like I, you should meet Dave? What do I do? Like, stop him? Hey, yeah, we, hi. Yeah, we could. Like, hey, I'm Nick. Yeah. He's always running around. He's always got, like, yeah. camera people behind him. So I'm like, just let him do oh, his thing. So he's busy. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I get a lot of questions. What is Dave like? What is Dan like? Um, I just They're just people. They're nice people. I don't know. Like, they, they give me the nod, but... Yeah. Um, um, give the barstool pitch. Like um, when you're, when you, I answer the phone, I answer the phone and you're like, Hey, I'm Nick from barstool. It's interesting. Normally, you know, what's so funny is I actually called someone that was a candidate and they had my number saved because this was the second time I'd called them and they said, Hey Nick. And I was like, hold on, you just threw me off because I have to start. <laughs> I have a script. <laughs> I have a script. My script is, mm -hmm. hey, this is Nick from Barstool. Mm -hmm. And like, it's funny, the guy works here now and he's like, do you want to start over? And I was like, can I? Like, <laughs> and so I was like, Appreciate it. I was like, hey man, this is Nick from Barstool. And he's like, yeah, I know, go on. Um, the other thing is most of the time people already know who we are. Like yeah. they've applied here or I've reached out to them somewhere like email, LinkedIn. And so they're already kind of familiar. But the general gist of it is I'm normally saying, you know, this is like, everything like you can't really put us in a box because we do online content we do in-person events we do food now we do merch so it's like you know what what are we not doing really um and i just say it's different it's yeah. going to change the way people consume media it can changes the way that we connect with fans everything um and so if you want to be part of something that's different than anything else out there that has a hand in every single thing that's happening that means that if you're someone who sees those things as fun and a challenge, like the same way I get a rush when we get new jobs, 
if you're someone that's like, Erica wants me to go to a live event, push some like food product and we have new merch, that's awesome. Like I get to have that experience and mm -hmm. I get to have that professional, you know, career like to the right person. That's exciting. So yeah, that's absolutely. kind of my sell to people is like we get to do all that and we're not tied down by red tape. We're not tied down by politics and bureaucracy in the office, things yep. like that. Does it often happen that we hire someone and you're like, ooh, I don't know if this is going to go uh, or this is going to work? No, not too much. Because I mean, like, you know, we I do the first screening and I think aside from my years of experience and then mixed in with the fact that like I know the brand pretty well from being a fan for years, it's like, and then coming in and working at past startup type companies, it's like I kind of know what is like the archetype that yeah. does well here. Yeah. Um, and with my recruiters, it's the same thing. Like I've taught them like, you know, here's the general like trait someone has to have to be successful. And if they don't have these baseline traits, it's, it's probably not going to work. Yeah. Um, you know, we can still talk to them and see maybe they're just shy. Maybe it'll come out. Um, but I mean, once you interview with me, you interview with a hiring manager, like between those two things, like we pretty You're much gonna we, get a feel for yeah, it. Yeah, we get the right feel. Um, and so one of the things we're dealing with this week is we have, it, it's funny, so we brought 110 people on. So we've hired since I got here, there were 12, maybe 15 people, and now we're, do you know how many people we have? We're probably- Like 375? Yeah, close to 400. Um, but we're having this issue where um, we had two people in similar roles in different groups and it's clearly they've both been here like four months ish and it's not going great like the onboarding wasn't great oh, yeah. so how do you think about that in working with because you, you have a lot of stakeholders right like yeah the salespeople are bitching at you because you haven't hired the roles fast enough. And right. you're like, but wait, when you don't respond to me when I'm trying to schedule an interview, I can't do that. Yeah. But then the second thing is like, look, I think sometimes people are kind of dismissive of recruiting and of HR in general, really. Yeah. I think there's like kind of a stigma in that. Like, It's actually a lesson I feel like I'm learning later on in my career. I always hated HR. Um, like really hated HR, which is why we never had HR here. But then I was like, fuck all I care about is HR. Like my yeah. whole day is HR. Like I am HR. Like I think my next job will be in HR. Like it's, yeah. it's a, it's a really, people are an amazing, they are the company. Like it's an amazing part of anything. But one thing that I think is hard is like, it's kind of garbage in garbage out. Like one thing I worry about here is like, we've just hired so many people. Like I just went through a business review for our, our commerce operations team. And I'm like, I don't, I don't not only don't recognize any of these names, I could not pin I could not pick out any one of these people. And I'm like, that's my company, like yeah. our company, like are they right? Are they gonna how are they gonna carry forward the mission if I don't even know what they look like and I've never laid eyes on them? So I think you're really important for people because you're kind of like my first line of defense in some ways, but I also feel you can only do as good a job as the, as a partner that you have. Yeah, I think for me and all the recruiters, a lot of it is like, before we even get to work on speaking to candidates, we interview the manager. Yeah. And we find out like, what exactly does this role do? And we'll ask them, what is the sell? Like, why should someone want to work for you? Yeah. And why should someone want to do this job? Yep. Um, where have other people fallen short? Like, why is this job hard? Why do you have it in the first place kind of thing? Um, so it really helps us kind of paint that accurate picture to the candidate of like, what are you walking into and what yeah. to expect here? And there's actually a quote from you. I think it's from Token CEO, um, where you say something like one of the best parts about working at Barstool is no one's going to tell you what to do all day. Mm -hmm. But one of the hardest parts uh, about working yeah. at Barstool is nobody's going to tell you what to do all day. But for the right mind, that's exciting. That's like, right. I mean, I can be this autonomous, like run with it kind of like things. So I think there's partially that, that like people kind of understand yeah. that like they're going to be given, you know, direction and it's kind of going to be like, all right, go. Like, you know, if you need something, you need to say something. Um, That's probably a good, like you're either on this side of that line and you like that, or you're on the other side of the line and you don't like that. I, 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 that's probably a good way to, yeah, to look at it. My first week here, um, they actually, Probably won't even want to say that they forgot about me in my first day. Um, I we didn't have HR. Yeah, we yeah. So I um, wait. What do you mean we forgot about you on your first day? So like you're just sitting out there and nobody's. So I was remote my first day, and uh, they shipped me a laptop 
but the laptop didn't arrive until like lunchtime or so. And so I logged on on my personal computer and I like kind of knew what to do though. Like I knew what email we were using. I knew we were on Gmail and I knew how to log in. I knew what ATS we were using, our, our tra applicant tracking system. I knew I needed to update LinkedIn. I knew I needed to get a login for LinkedIn. Like, You're like I made my own first day to do I list. had my own to-do list. Yeah. I was like, hey, who's the head of, like, you know, I saw the jobs that were open on the website. And so I reached out to the HR person at the time and said like, hey, who's the manager for this? Gaz? Well, then I'm going to put a meeting on Gaz's calendar to introduce myself and like yeah. get started. And they were just like, uh, okay. And luckily, fortunately, that has never happened again that someone was forgotten. But it kind of mm. just goes to show like we have that kind of, we look for that. It was like a self-starter and like yeah. in the truest sense of the word. Like legitimately. Legitimately. Like maybe your computer will <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it arrives. But, Nobody's telling you what to do. You know, and again, like luckily that's never happened again. But that's really just like the extreme case yeah. of like what we look for. Like if you were dropped in the office with no direction. Yeah, what would you do? Yeah. But also it's something we should, I think you've done an amazing job and something we should get better at. Um, Luckily we have the HR team now. Yeah, the HR team is great now. Now we have one. Yeah. Uh, so that's something we're all talking about yeah. is like, what is onboarding look like now? What yeah. can we fix moving forward? Yeah. Okay. So let's just pivot really quickly to LinkedIn. So you're kind of a, you're funny to me. I like you so much. I love what you do but you remind me of a content person because the, you think about LinkedIn the way our, I think we have just really special content people and the way they think about making content and talking about whatever it may be, like yeah. sports, entertainment, news, celebrity, gossip, politics, military, whatever. You have that for LinkedIn. You think like a content creator. So talk a little bit about how do you think about LinkedIn? How do you use LinkedIn? What do you do on LinkedIn? Yeah. Um, so I guess it all started originally, like my wife is actually a recruiter as well. And so she has like a LinkedIn following and she makes like, you know, YouTube videos, things like that. And she was looking at my page and was like, why do you have so many followers? Like, what do you do? And I, I had a lot even before I came here. Like, I want to say I'm at about like 31,000 now. And I was maybe at like 20, 20,000 before I got here. Okay. Um, and she was like, you need to do something with that. Like whether it's like, you know, pushing yourself, pushing Barstool, like you need to do something. And for a long time, it was like, I didn't know what people wanted to hear, wanted to see. And like, it's also scary to put yourself out it's there. It's the worst, yeah. And so I started looking at what do other people, what is the content I do like? Um, I liked people who were funny, authentic. I liked people that were not self-promoting and being douchey. Um, and I was like, you know, what do I need to do on here? I need to post a job. And so I'm going to use a picture from Barstool and I'm going to turn it into a meme and we'll see how that does. And it just was a hit right away. And so I think the fact that there's not much Barstool content on LinkedIn, which I mean, it's not necessarily like the same thing as posting it to Twitter, sure. I guess, but um, there's stoolies that, you know, they work and they have yeah white collar jobs and, or, you know, whatever kind of jobs and they're out there on LinkedIn and they want to see that content too, but putting it out there in the spin of like, Hey, here's the job that we have, or here's why, you know, our benefits are great, you know, and it's just using something that's relatable. Um, so yeah, like just for So Nick was saying the other day, like that I really loved, it's like, you're like, all right, Friday, I was working from home and I'm going to show a picture of me working from home. Cause I want to show people you can work from home at Barstool. Like that's just a very, barstool way of doing it. it's not rocket science yeah but it's honest and it's like hey it's genuine yeah it's like, genuine and it's also thoughtful about what am i trying to show and how do i show it i i love that i thought it was yeah i thought it was just so cool so it's a lot of fun i like it a lot i'm always now like thinking with that mindset of like yeah. you know i see things on twitter i see things in youtube videos and i'm like oh i gotta clip this for linkedin or like how am i going to use this so it's funny i'll actually be like laying in bed and my wife, you know, she's a recruiter. And so I'll be like, what do you think of this caption for this photo? Or what do you think of this? So what um, kind of company does she re recruit for? Uh, E-commerce. So, okay. Yeah. So, so she, do we compete over hires? No. Um, they, sh yeah, no. She what does. do like two recruiters talk about? Like this would actually be a really good topic. Like yeah. when you have a marriage or a family where there's like two lawyers versus two recruiters versus like two producers. The two producers probably never talk to each other. They have like the headphones on and the <laughs> lawyers are fighting. What are the recruiters doing? Uh, they like, just sell to each other all day long? Yeah. It's like, oh, you won't believe this crazy in mail I got today. Okay. Or like, you won't believe what this hiring manager said today okay. or something like yeah, that. Yeah. It's a lot of just like you're relating over the same headaches that you both have. Yep. Um, 
That's fun. Crazy stories, crazy yeah. resumes, crazy cover letters. The, the cover letters here, for example, are nuts. Like, you know, we'll have an opening for a sports book or something, and the cover letter will be like, you know, like sup writers, you know, like, yeah. and it's like, well, this isn't bad. Like, you know, it's all yeah. brand. Like, let's see what they have to say. Yeah. Like, you know, and so yeah. it's kind of funny to see stuff like that. Do you look for candidates on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok? Not really, um, just because, like, I don't really hire for our content hires. Like, you know, people like Joey, yeah. Pat, Big Cat, like, you know, that's usually you or Dave is hiring them. But, but I wonder if you could use that to build, you know, kind of like you and your wife looking at YouTube. Like, you could, Yeah. you should think about that. Well, we do look at, like, the Barstool, like, Viceroy accounts and stuff. Yeah. So, like, we'll look to see, like, you know, Barstool Indiana, like, yeah. how is this account doing kind of yeah. thing. But usually that's more so, like, if we have an opening for a social specialist, We'll ask Gaz and Gaz will say, oh, I have this great top performer. They're, they should be yeah. coming on full time. And that's kind of like, so that's kind of like our farm system okay. in a way is like the Viceroy program yeah, the and like the awesome. city pages, things like that. All right. So let's do a rapid fire. Um, we'll both play. Okay. Okay. So you can ask questions too. Ooh, I honestly did not prepare. Well, no, that's okay. Cause I'm going to ask stupid questions and okay. you'll just think of something smarter. What's your number one pet peeve on a resume? Uh formatting just when it's it doesn't have to be perfect but when it's just so jumbled that it's hard to read like the lines are cut off the lines are cut off do you like throw that small. resume out i would throw that resume out usually because it's yeah. like if you can't even submit the resume right like yep. i get that formatting issues happen but when it's that bad it's kind of like oh yeah i agree i looked at a resume this weekend from someone who i adore and there was a fucking typo a word spelled wrong in the first paragraph yeah and i was like dude that's rough. If you cannot spell check the first paragraph, I'm not talking about what computer programs you know at the bottom. I get that. But yeah. like, I once spelled YouTube wrong in a resume. It was like early, early YouTube. It was like YouTube was just starting. And I think I put U as in like the letter Oh, yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get the job. Okay. Um, what's the best way to write a thank you note to a recruiter or a hiring manager? What should it say? It should be I'm honestly short, <laughs> but I think just being genuine and sincere in it. Like uh, we read so many things, whether it's a cover letter, a resume, like a thank you note that it's easy to tell when it's like something you copy and pasted. Yep. So I like ones that are short, simple to the point, they're genuine and they reference something from the call yeah, that like you have. Yeah, like they have like, a tie, yeah, they're personal. Like, you know, you mentioned something that we spoke about or yep. something about the job that caught your attention. Um, yep. I think those ones are nice. Great, number one pet peeve from hiring managers. Uh, slow to respond. That's the biggest thing. I mean, the whole, how we get measured aside from the number of hires is how fast do we hire. And if I got you your person and you interviewed them, but then you take two days to get back to me, like that sucks. So yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, but I'm annoying. I'll chase them down. I'll yep. show up at your desk. Like, you know, I'll, I'll yeah, tap yeah, you no, on the you're shoulder. Like, I need, I need yeah. a response. What about, um, best question you've heard in an interview or one really great question that you've heard? Um, I really don't know if I have like a favorite one like that. I think there's just so many that it's like you use them in a certain way. Um, I just think open-ended questions about past experience for me are like my favorites. Um, so getting examples of when people have done stuff in the past. Um, one that I've been using a little bit more lately is like, tell me about something that you've had to teach yourself at work recently. Like, how did you mm, do it? How did you go question. about it? Yep. How do you handle frustration at work? Like, tell mm -hmm. me about something that was frustrating recently. What did you do? How did you overcome it kind of thing? Um, I think in a place like this, like I said, where, you know, you can get dropped in at times. It's like, can you teach yourself? Um, and what if something is frustrating to you? How are you going to handle it? Yep. Um, What's your, like, number one pet peeve in interviews? Um, I don't like the question of, like, is there anything I said in this interview that, like, would prevent me from getting this job yeah, or something that like That's that. A fucking, like, like I'm going to tell you. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't know. Like yeah. I, I still have other people to talk to. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Like this went fine, but yeah. I'm going to have to think about it. I'm going to look at my notes, compare you to other people. Like it is what it is, but I don't know. What other questions do you got? Would you have questions for me in our rapid fire? Um, I think like there's the one part of my job that I don't really do, which is the talent hiring yeah. them and stuff like that. So I guess, what is that like? Like, how do we find them? Or like, how do those negotiations the, come about? Like, there's not really a process. The, the talent is a, is really from talented people. Like Dave has a really good eye for talent. Gaz has a very good eye for talent. Big Cat has a good eye for talent. Um, people who watch the internet understand talent. So I really trust 
I trust them. I think I'm I'm better coming in after the fact of like they've been identified and it's like, all right, are they for real? Do they have the work ethic? Yeah. Do they want to work here? How would this work? Are they willing to do? You know, the, the hard thing with talent talent is the best talent do everything. They jump into everything. They're like immersed in Barstool. And the more you deal with agents and lawyers and middlemen, it's more about what's contracted. Right. And I think the people who just do contracted things are actually get, get screwed because they're not part of the ethos and therefore they don't get bigger. Like what people don't understand here, I think, is that what made Dave, Dan, Kevin, Keith, like our early guys, what made them so successful is they were always mixing it up with one another. And the more people do that, the better off it is. Like, I think Alex Bennett is doing an amazing job of that right now. Like her jumping into Rough and Rowdy, her doing Mean Girls, her, you know, she's mixing it up with Brianna and all different people. Like that's very, very calculated, it's very smart. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Um, okay, what jobs do you wanna promote? Uh, we have social media openings right now. Yep. We have openings in production right now. We have a Snapchat producer that just opened. Um, we still have one or two more sales openings. So check out our careers page, barstoolsports.com backslash jobs. Okay. Simple. Um, and how do people follow you on LinkedIn? Nick Marticelli. Okay. There's a little follow button. You know, okay. Say hi. Um, and yeah, pretty simple. That's I post, great. I post anytime there's a new job, I post it there as well. Yep. Um, so even if you're not checking our careers page every day, anytime there's a new job, I'll post it, do some kind of funny video meme kind of thing. Um, so two ways to stay up to date on it. So before I let you go, we've talked college, we've talked do's and don'ts of college, we talked to Nick M. Now everybody knows how to get a job and crush it on LinkedIn. I want to have a small commercial break for why quiet quitting sucks. I think quiet quitting sucks, sucks. Quiet quitters are losers. Like it sucks. One is like, why quit on yourself? Like I just totally disagree with the mentality that you should, that you should just give up, that you kind of sh sink into the background. It's like the, um, Oh my God, what's that meme where the guy just goes back into the hedges? Oh, it's Homer Simpson. Okay, like the, it's like the Homer Simpson image shrinking back into the shrub. Um, I have a lot of feelings about quiet quitting because I think quiet quitting, you know, so you hate your job, so you can do your job in less time, so you don't care about where you work, you don't care about what you do. Quiet quitting is not a way to be happier. I don't think quiet quitting makes your non-work life better. I think it's opting out on you being your best, learning your most, doing all you can, and becoming the biggest, most enriched, most fulfilled person possible. So quiet quitting has been around forever. Okay, like Kevin Clancy, I think, started a podcast in like 1997 called Mail Time. And the whole concept of mail time was like, you're mailing it in at work. Now, Kevin Clancy, I think worked for Deloitte and was an accountant and wanted to be a podcast star, which he ended up being. Kevin Clancy was in the wrong job. And what Kevin Clancy talked about on his podcast and in his blogs was like how miserable cube life was. To Kevin Clancy's credit, he jumped to Barstool Sports and then the rest is history. But I don't think quiet quitting is new. I think what's new about quiet quitting is that social media has made it that people who have been quiet quitting for years or people who don't like their jobs or people who just aren't into it at work, it's giving voice to it in a way where apathy at work has never been lionized. It's never been lauded. It's never been something that's been celebrated or cool. It's frankly been something you don't talk about. And now it's something that is talked about very virally. When I was starting my career, when I was in college or even in high school, it was the 80s and the 90s. Like it was all about money. It was all about work. Like the two shows the two pieces of content that had the biggest impact on me and my life and my career was 
one, Working Girl, and two was the show 30 something, which was about, you know, two guys. Did you watch these shows? Oh, I fucking love those shows. Oh. <laughs> so good. Um, were, was Working Girl and 30 something. Like, this was the era of Wall Street. Everybody wanted to get rich, everybody knew they had to work hard. It was all about the grind. I dreamed of living in New York City because New York City felt so alive. It felt like a city that was about work. I'm starting to feel like I'm in the last generation of people who are going to love work and who are going to want to work. People are becoming less resilient. And when you're less resilient, it's easier to opt out than figuring out how to learn. I think the second thing with quiet quitting is that, you know, while I was watching Working Girl and 30 something and I wanted to make money, I didn't have any money, like I, I wanted that life. I think what's there's so much more media now, there's so much more content now, and what that content is about is monetizing lifestyle. You know, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about what's happening now socially is that why would you work? Like, why do you slog through your accounting job when you could post a picture on OnlyFans and make as much as you would make in six months? Like, the world has changed in terms of how people are able to monetize their leisure and how they're able to monetize the image of their life. And in a lot of ways, that's what seems like the single biggest or best thing to do, to work as little as possible, to make as much money as possible, and to have that money be made around something that embodies a lifestyle that someone else would emulate. I think the thing with that that's so dangerous is that like, what are you learning from your OnlyFans account? Like you might make $10,000, $20,000, $45,000. When that dries up, and it will, you either get old or your boobs start to sag or you get fat or you, you know, find a job where you can't OnlyFans all day. What have you learned? Like what is your marketable skill that you've developed? And I think at some point, you know, the labor market is gonna contract employers are going to become more stringent about what they can afford and what they'll require of people who they, who they hire and when that happens the people who know how to work the people who are resilient the people who have built skills are going to be the ones who hold the jobs like i think quiet quitting is just a recipe for dissatisfaction um you know one of the things i love about barstool sports is like we have for the most part, I think there's plenty of quiet quitters here, but I think for the most part, we have a company where people are like really, really, really engaged and they're actively wanting to learn and they want to be part of something and they want to build something. Like that's why I love this company so much. Like I would put us up against anybody because we have so many people that are like that. And I really, that's why I believe we will always, you know, so long as we have that spirit be successful, and that's also why I believe this place is a shortcut for anyone who works here because they will be successful. And because we have that culture, people are fulfilled. And I think what's hard about quiet quitting is it's just, it, it's just going to make you dissatisfied. There's still expectations at work. There's still things you have to deliver. You just become, frankly, more disgruntled about how you do them. And I think that when you're disgruntled or disenfranchised or disengaged at work, that apathy kind of carries over to your life. And if you're not going to be engaged in everything you do and you're not going to work to make the things that you do better and the places that you're at more, more workable for you, I think that's just, you're just setting yourself up for years of being dissatisfied. And I think that's just a real shame. And I think the biggest thing that, that employers need to think about and managers need to think about and people need to think about is that, and I don't think we're equipped for it, is that work has changed. What people figured out in the pandemic is that there was a way to get your work done in less time. There was a way to get your work done without being at work and there was a way to get your work done virtually versus in person. That's never gonna change. Like we're not going back. People like being at home. People like being virtual. People like having a shorter work day. We've gotta figure out as managers, as CEOs, as employers, as people, like how do you be happy and fulfilled at work 
when work looks different than it did two years ago. And I think quiet quitting is just honestly like the shittiest way to opt out on that. The biggest thing of it is that people are doing a disservice, not just to their company. I think a lot of people are like, fuck you company, I'm gonna mail it in. I, I think that's short term. I think longer term, it's going to have a huge, huge impact on your life and how you, most importantly, how you feel about your life. All right, so I'm gonna let you go now. Um, thank you to Mackenzie and Devin and Bryn and everyone. Perfect timing. All right, yes. all right. so lunch is here. I'm gonna hang up now. Um, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you, for, to, to, thank you to everyone who gave a rating and a review. Be sure to listen to us next week. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. If you left us a rating and a review, be on the lookout for us in your DMs. And we'll see everybody back here next week. Bye.